My name is John Kenny, and I'm the director of the Iowa City UNESCO City of Literature Organization. And I would like to welcome you to the 13th annual Iowa City Book Festival. This is the first in-person event of this year's festival, but more importantly, it is the first in-person book festival event since October 6th of 2019. So we are very happy to be back with an audience of readers and a couple of writers here to share with us tonight. So I'm glad that you could join us. And hello as well to those folks who are watching on Zoom. So given our current situation, I would like to thank those here in the room for maintaining social distance and for keeping your masks on throughout the event. To aid with comprehension for those watching virtually, our speakers will be removing their masks when reading. So much has changed in our world over the last two years, but the one constant that we can find comfort in is the written word. And so I'm very pleased to be able to have two uh, very talented poets here to share their words with us this evening. Before we get started, I wanted to thank our sponsors. The City of Iowa City and the University of Iowa are our main sponsors. We also have sponsorship from Iowa Public Radio. And I would like to thank our partners with Iowa, uh, excuse me, the Iowa City Public Library, who have always made it very easy for us to have events here and have been uh, wonderful partners with us throughout the life of the festival. I also would like to thank our friends at Prairie Lights who are on hand to sell books, and I hope that you will keep them very busy at the end of the uh, event tonight. So with our two poets here, Mark Ray and Julie Hansen, we will have each of them read a selection of their poems, and then we will have a short time at the end for some discussion. We'll take some questions from folks here in the audience, and those who are watching on Zoom can also submit, and we'll be monitoring the Q&A section there for those folks who are watching from home. So our first poet tonight is Julie Hansen of Cedar Rapids. Hansen is the author of Unbeknownst, an Iowa Poetry Prize winner, and 2012 Kate Tufts Discovery Award finalist. It was published by the University of Iowa Press. Her second collection, The Audible and the Evident, was selected by Maggie Smith for the Hollis Summers Poetry Prize and was published by Ohio University Press in 2020. Hansen's work has earned fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Vermont Studio Center, as well as publication in New Ohio Review, Volt, Plume, Copper Nickel, and other journals. She holds a master's in expository writing from the University of Iowa and an MFA in poetry from the Iowa Writers' Workshop. Regarding Hansen's poetry, the poet John Cady wrote that her poems are natural and shapely with a subtle architecture that you inhabit all the more fully because you hardly notice it. Their language is relaxed and exact, pervaded by an understated and touching humor. And yet the poems hover on the edge of mystery the mystery of thought. Please help me welcome Julie Hansen to the Book Festival. Oh, I get to take this off. Uh, welcome to the festival from me as well. Um, that was a lovely introduction. Thank you, John. Um, I, I knew I wouldn't be able to just thank you uh, without just having a post-it speech written, so I do. I still have an email in my drafts folder waiting to go out to Jan Weissmiller. It's dated March 3rd, 2020. I just learned that my first reading for the Audible and the Evident at Prairie Lights had been scheduled not only for National Poetry Month, <clears throat> but for the 22nd day of April, Earth Day. It was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. I was crazy with gratitude for my good fortune. Before I felt the time was right to send that message, you know what happened. Events that were live were postponed, and then they were canceled. It happened to me, it happened to Mark, it happened to a lot of people, and it happened to all of you, because you know, either you were holding your own events or you were <clears throat> wanting to go to some. So it's really good to be here now. And I'm grateful to Jan and to John Kenyon and to the organizers and all of you for enabling poems from my book and from the Gravity Well to be read out loud here tonight. And I'll start with the first poem in my book and skip around a little after I drink some water.
Real life, dear voyeur, real life. Much has kept me from my task. October has peaked here. To look out the window is to lift from the chair in order to get closer to those leaves, still shining with the drop in temperature, radiant with colors too exact and pleasing to explain. To look out is to leave the house entirely in search of a justifiable chore. The garlic, for example, must be planted and soon, lest the best of our seed cloves shrivel away to no better than dust in a casing right there in the box. And not only that, we are completely out of celery. I tell you, real life is a pull and a lure and a fling-back thing, a need and a need and a slow-motion slide through all sorts of partially identified, coming right at you, sudden matters. Some of them just plain practical to attend to. And then right before autumn, the yard was in summer, the whole out of doors bobbing or zooming, at any rate, busy. I hung her laundry on the line and charmed by the shape and efficiencies of the wooden pins was made nostalgic for my own first toys. This is a little uh, lyrical meditation on representation and it's problems and delights. It's called of. It starts with language and moves into the visual realm so to speak, of. To think that we refer still to the ring of the telephone, as if it ever once made the circular sound that comes from the shape of a bell. And the brown of the leaves falling down from the oak is closer to the color of the skin on the back of my hands we call white. What is the color now? Is it brown? The horizon in town will not let the pure, clear blue of the sky touch ground. And so it is that children instinctively restrict it to a strip high up, made comical to us because of the corner cut away for the sun, the obligatory sun, of which just a pinch is limitless. Who can represent it with the crayons and the standard set that shine? Even when it's all filled in, the picture omits what was meant. But the houses of childhood step up large, so forward on the page, that the lawns tucked under them then, putting the door of the house as near as truth to us. And as an afterthought drawn over it, the dark knob slow considered and deliberate. As for proportion, even when it slips a bit and delivers the small headed dog, the boy with one ear larger, the fence that bends and sends itself, not back, but straight up skyward and looking like a ladder. The longer we let it stay with us, the less it looks far-fetched. Am I too loud, too soft? Everything's okay? Okay. <clears throat> this is one of those titles that just sort of slams right into the poem. With just the sentence keeps going. It is unconquerable. It has pulled down the branch of the far back ash like a bow ready for release. It is a vine so thick and strong it could be used as rope on a steamer. It could tie down anything, but won't. Instead, it gropes where it will and travels clandestine and thickens in June when we are too busy planting the food and the beauty to notice such a thing. Quiet, gloomy. Then it is August and hot. We can't possibly take on a challenge of that range in complexity. Its allies are the heat, the humidity, and the four compost piles of our very own doing. Its strength is its strength, unmerciful, unrelenting. Giving audience to our outside endeavors, it calculates ruin in other quarters. The plaster has powdered where a crack in the attic traverses the wall. Mark its progress now toward the aloe lopsided and loyal in the terracotta pot. My husband can laugh because he's, he knows that vine, even though he's heard, <laughs> he's heard that poem a million times. <laughs> the vacuum. Don't ask what it was all about. Ask instead how sudden it was. How complete. One minute, I was an ordinary woman vacuuming. 
a thing it seemed I had too recently done, and the next minute sobbing, emitting sounds loud, rapid, and long. It was the kind of sobbing that makes you feel five, five years old, or housing a feeling five people wide. I was seated, my left elbow on my left knee, my glasses hanging from my left hand as if they were the problem. No use in wearing them, no use in putting them down. And the vacuum, part pet, part sculpture, sprawled awkwardly, still shrieking on the floor in front of me. The sorrow seemed pulled from outside unselectively, as if I had swallowed a magnet. Each time I felt that I could silence this, that something had been spent, something settled, I opened my eyes to that canister, attachments on its back, hose, and extension, reality piece which had withstood the worst of me, had witnessed, and was unaffected. This one has an epigraph. It's taken from a tea bag tag. It goes like this. Our thoughts are forming the world. The poem's called Dialectic and Infusion. And as much as our thoughts are forming the world, let us control them. And as much as our thoughts are forming the world, let us take off the leash. I remember a time we were quarreling horribly on a walk at an arboretum, and we were brought to a halt by a surfeit of perfectly circular ferns, the ricochet gone from the glade, the dark peat of buoyancy. We receptives, we don't know what we are until somewhere seeps into us self-evident. I have to have a little slug of this. <clears throat> okay, I know that this poem has uh, a statistic that needs updating, but the poem really wasn't drafted, the first draft, that long ago. And so I decided to leave it that way as sort of a marker for how far we've progressed. The poem's called They Are Widening the Road the pipes have been revealed, enormous, that lurked all along underground. The clay-colored dirt is piled. Barriers are fortified by barrels, hurdles, stakes. Here's the backhoe making three-point turns, the traffic at a halt, the heat, the sun that bakes the dust, the sun through glass that magnifies the heat. Too near to every business here and house, a mile of road has moved from plan to controversy to regret. Several of the orange cones disturbed have tumbled into rolling hazards. Here is the church, the hardware store, the auto supply, the bank, the gallery, the pharmacy, the school. Here is the other auto supply. Here is the world with its six billion people, with its how many random cancellations of the single will, hopeful, defeated, locked once to another, rhythm, scent, and curvature, in the ancient act of increase, not thought of in these terms, but felt, a direction that was sure, detained, detoured, deferred. The personal is different than the whole. We are directed into other lanes. Does anybody out there feel that the issue of fairness has been given all too often a disproportionate attention? It takes but gentle mention in the matters tabled yet again. With us or without us, an agenda slips along like mercury through tubes of glass. The line is longer and the great big sound from close behind is right inside our car. There is no moving up in line and the pavement of the lane ahead is ripped. Pilot car, follow me. This is a little prose poem. It brings me right back to Clyde Lyon Elementary School. It's called Swist. I had inadvertently, let me start that again. I had inadvertently stepped on the heel of the girl in front of me and she had walked right out of her shoe, which was to us hilarious 
largely because it disturbed the solemnity of single file and made a daring little joke on the oft-repeated phrase, hands to yourselves. Admittedly, we did giggle and bunch up, and I was singled out and put in front, making memory clearer. The plain beige linoleum, despite its stubborn scuff marks, gleamed. I so wanted to mock the walk of our teacher now that I had been made an isolate, put in a category all of my own, neither teacher nor student now, but one wanting discipline. The cheese stands alone. I was feeling that. I could feel the little wind through the holes. Daylight. When people are first born, they look like they've recently failed. They come covered in blood and shrieking. Even their skin is disheveled, their hair is a wet mess. With any luck, the mother isn't interested in that. She gives no thought to a life previous to this one, the one nested on her stomach and propped up. She cares to be held long in its unblinking eyes. Your next best chance is in the stranger's face. Better put away your handheld device. You may never know how your mother felt about you all those years ago. You may never get it right with the people you're related to. The bricks on the street are glistening and the clouds are high. How am I doing on time? I feel like I've been reading forever. Still got some to go. <clears throat> okay. Um, I, get, I get to chat a little bit in preface to this one. Um, so I, it's been a while, but I, I do love to travel. Um, but I find it exhausting. I can't eat my porridge. And bed's wrong. I can't even sleep in my own bed very well. And I'm overstimulated. I want to see everything. But I've learned to counter that overstimulation part, at least. Um, by planning in episodes of respite. And this poem comes about through one such attempt. The setting is a classical Chinese scholar's garden in Vancouver, British Columbia. And the principles of design used uh, spring from Taoism and Feng Shui. Uh, one of them, one of the principles, is articulated in the path itself. Um, I read. <laughs> Uh, that is that no matter one puts one no, no matter where you put yourself on the path, you cannot take in the entirety of the path. So this discovery is constant as you go through. Um, now, though I planned a late morning time in this garden that I thought would let us center and breathe and you know rest and it wouldn't be overstimulating, I didn't check out other events that might be happening simultaneous to our visit that could possibly intrude on our time there. And one such event did exist, and it is incorporated into the poem. The poem's called In the Garden of Dr. Sun Yat-shen. I'd never seen bamboo like that, living, green. I slipped between the stems, weaving through them. Permission seemed to come from something in their structure, and through the lattice openings in the wall between the gardens, I saw people passing slowly, examining the vegetation growing closest or noticing what had before been hidden from them. In the garden of Dr. Sun Yat-shen, the paths have been allowed to modulate in their materials, gray sunken pebbles and darker oblong stones and curved tiles glazed and cooled to darkest brown reappear throughout the grounds as shingles on pavilion roofs and worked into the landscaping, there they are again, set on edge and lining sections of the path, establishing by increments one tempered tone. Sometimes people slowed, sometimes they stopped, their postures settled, sinking. And then this drifted down and caught. It made no difference to them anymore, and never mind, and let it drop. Although we couldn't help but hear the air wound taut bright white screamings from the Molson Indy near. I'd glimpsed it from the sky train just before our stop, 
when a man seated facing me, 28 he must have been, Asian, in his business suit, straightened in excitement and smiling hard enough to be a boy, lifted from his seat and lodged that moment into history. In the garden of Dr. Sun Yat-shen, everyone walked through that noise or paused in it as if it weren't unfortunate. There, everything has been measured. Everything has been observed. Long ago, a gong was struck. Sound shimmied through the air, through bamboo, pine, and winter-blooming plum. The sound was in the pond, the stones, each leaf and space between. The sound was in the wood plank sequence of the bridge. The turtle on the rock held his head level to that sound. He would never move. The sound would never stop. This is the, the last poem in the book, but if I may, I have no sense of time. I see there's a clock, but never mind. It's up to you. Um, I'll read this one and two more from Unbeknownst. Is that okay? Okay. Ocean. When the temperature exceeds 72 degrees, I will wade farther in and swim, I promised myself. So when on the very next day it did, I had to brave it then. And when I entered the ocean, the wind was strong and the waves were high. I had not at all pre prepared myself for the salt. Had I recalled the fact in advance that salt comes from our seas, I still would not have been ready to receive it like that at such potency, I mean, in my nose, in my mouth. I sputtered at first. Soon enough, though, I was flat on my back, relaxed, as good as adapted, and just plain glad for my luck. This is gorgeous, so warm, in September, no less. But, of course, in time, I stood up. Hardly had one uneventful second pass before I was startled by a crab, the tender and rarely touched skin on the top of my foot signaling trespass in this fashion. Alert, alert, something tickety and alive is currently crossing the bridge. But I recovered from that and attempted to swim as when I do laps at the Y which I found to be unneeded, really, at this place in time. So I bobbed and bicycled about and enjoyed the expanse. When I returned to the towel where the beat of my heart drummed into the sand, I was dry within moments, my muscles relaxed and exhausted, and I said to myself, or possibly aloud, in the quiet outrushing form of a sigh, this is most excellent, which translates as follows. It is like I am lying here dead and hyper alive all at once, lying here with profound passivity in the midst of big sound and big sun and the landing and leaving of waterfowl, and all of it is rhythmic, as I too am rhythmic with my pulse in sand presence as well, and I can feel a tilting going on here, but its rhythms are bigger and louder and feel like forever. In fact, they encompass me now and will surpass me one day, and how pleasing. It was once to imagine that they, at least they, will not end, but will be everlasting. So I have in this book, Unbeknownst, my first collection, which was published by the University of Iowa Press, <laughs> right here. Um, I have several poems in here, and have written a few since, uh, that were generated by using uh, for their first lines, one of the fragments left to us from Sappho. Uh, I use translation uh, from ancient Greek by Anne Carson, since I have no clue how to translate that language. Um, the task was then, of course, to create a context for a piece of language that uh, had gone centuries without its intended context. And um, I did not presume to guess what that context was. I just invented something. Um, so uh, in this poem, the fragment used is, but I to you of a white goat. I imagined that I was speaking to my spouse in the front row here, or second row. To encapsulate the unattainable, you speak to me of work, but I to you of a white goat. I say how the goat escapes always just as a piece of it has become visible to me. Above the bark of a fallen tree, I saw the topmost ridge of hair along the back of the white goat, gone as I focused harder. To the side of the cabin, a little ways off, I glimpsed the paintbrush tail of the white goat. 
I imagine the neck bent to the hostas, a luscious stand of them below the small rear window. And what peered at me in traffic through two slots in a livestock truck but the face of the white goat? I stared incredulous as it passed me to merge with traffic headed towards Toledo. These are the subjects we endure in order that we may better understand each other and consider how different they are, the coyness and carelessness and striving of your co-workers, the appearances of the goat, the routine revamping of technologies you depend on and the intangibility of the goat. This evening I reported first, sorry, today, the first spring-like day, how the goat would have enjoyed it. All morning as I worked in the yard removing old leaves and old growth, I pictured him standing on the grassy mound, not much longer or wider than himself, to get a better view of the neighbor's crocus. And this is a real short one. Uh, again, its first line is a fragment from Sappho that goes, wider by far than an egg. And the poem's called Untitled. Whiter by far than an egg is the paper I haven't the wherewithal to fill, its unblemished surface a reproach. A good opportunity, it speaks of potential. It's an assignment I don't understand. It implicates my life with emptiness. Once, it says, things happened, and you were changed by them. That's it. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Julia. That was wonderful to hear your poems. I'm glad that you were willing to share them with us. So our next poet tonight is Mark Ray of Iowa City. He's the author of three poetry collections, The Smaller Half, On Hours, and Gravity Well. All three were published by Rescue Press, the most recent of these coming in 2020. Mark has an MFA in poetry from the Iowa Writers' Workshop. His poems have appeared in the Iowa Review, Jubilat, Make Literary Magazine, Sixth Finch, and other literary journals. When selecting Mark's poems for the Penn Poetry Series, guest editor Shane McRae wrote, Mark Ray is one of my favorite poets. And I don't mean that he's one of my favorite poets writing today, although he is or that he's one of my favorite poets writing in a particular way. I mean, Mark Ray is one of my favorite poets. In his first book, The Smaller Half, he showed himself to be a master of something very like the plain style. But there was a strangeness just below the surface of these poems, and that strangeness surfaces more and more frequently of late. Now, I would say he is also a master of something I want to call plain strangeness. Please help me welcome Mark Ray. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I'm uh, from a long line of mumblers, so if during the course of this I get progressively quiet, just um, let me know. Um, John, thank you for that introduction. Uh, Julie, thank you. That reading was just fantastic. Um, I really admired Julie's uh, work for a while since the first book, and it's a, a pleasure to get to hear her read. Um, I want to thank Jan also and Pray Lights uh, for helping to arrange this reading. And as ever, I would like to thank uh, Rescue Press uh, for these books being in the world. And to thank uh, Iowa City Public Library also for being the, the venue tonight and uh, also um, the nest in which uh, a lot of these poems are hatched. 
So I'm going to read from Gravity Well, The Size of Me. I was the size of a flower, many different sizes. The time of year factored, rainfall, cloud cover. I was one size when a bee entered. When a bee entered, I held a narrative in a moment. Moment, a link in a chain, chain dropped in a bucket of chains, links touching many links. There was sunshine and a history of protein chains. To evolve was the general purpose, but to let sunlight grow me in the soil was the purpose. Pollen attaches to a fuzzy body drawn to nectar. To retell the narrative changes the narrative, is the story. To the advantage of tiny hook-like appendages, I have no smooth surface. Election cycle. The morning sun is beautiful. It's light, I mean, reflected from the leaves about to fall and the blood fresh beneath our mouths. And here is a crow undoing a hefty bag. Over there is a birdhouse near a bird feeder in a lawn we own, if paying for means that. And we have in our heart enacted caring in the exchange of paper and metal money for a bag of seed will never lay before anyone we love that has the words, thank you, uncommon in the speech of birds. We made the house with tools and hands we would describe as our own, if. Never to divide by zero. A voice raised in anger at the office, raised and sustained. Someone's job is to watch for the light of past events in the sky. Eyes and antenna raised in hindsight. What would you rather undertake as part of your last day? With prescription sunglasses and a functional player, one can subdue miles lot after lot containing second stomachs. What is the value of a dollar rejected by a machine? Above, butterflies and raptors lend their wings to gargoyles. Previous Lives Stacked waist high along the wall of the grimy and cobwebbed dining room. A ceiling fan, but the curtains last drawn when? Were calendars. Expired. Square days X'd away and square days whiter than hair, whiter than cataracts. There was ongoing, then over. Bare feet then the relief of stepping from cold tile to the kitchen rug, from cold tile to the bathroom rug, the cold of rubbing alcohol applied to open skin. The question of that day of the dog's bath, whose first memory? Rumination, a stack of squares, beads off the string, the ones never retrieved down the vent in the dark and mildew of the ductworks. What is before the breath? What after? How could anyone sleep so close to the tracks? The same stars above, water from the tap beside. There is only so much between the lines of an equal sign. The lines never meeting, parallel, containing space, but open like this house revisited, windows all open now to draw air, to disturb the mess, ruin, ruins. Art. 
on sleeping well. She's still asleep, so I take my coffee to the farthest room. There are new webs I'll need to remove, silver in the sunbeam at the hinge edge of the door. I clear space on the desk, stacks of books like neglected friends, all facing the same way. I'm reading an astronaut's memoir. One must have to like the learning to train repeatedly for unlikely contingencies. In the slant light, shadows of frost across the carpet. Strange to say, at the mercy of weather conditions. To ask, knowing only what you knew then, would you make the same decisions? I've thought this morning a dozen times. A faint vinegar now I've cleaned the urn. Through a strand, vibration calls a spider to the struggle. Birthday. The numbness was explained to me in my fingers, downriver from the forest in my neck, a smaller and smaller forest, branches always closer. Though I could still grip my arthritic grip, bring the cup with both hands. In that time, my job had light lifting. For the successor, I left notes, passwords on one post-it. I tried to be helpful, but we never know. To look for change in my pockets meant having to look. Nightstand. Ground divorces from ground and red from the heart beneath the press that screws with love the apple towards cider. Fragments are left of spectrum when chlorophyll abandons the leaves, old yellowing story. Selling dismiss dismisses picking. A classic of skyrocketed afternoon becomes lewd, interpreted. Her favorite song from childhood, dragged through bong water by blacklight. Midnight, you held me once through the lace veil interrupted by actual touch. What made a recipe for vinegar of if, then, therefore, in, or negative in, some, or its homonym? Both cuffs are open beside the water. where all moats lead. All day the wooden sphere gets thought of as tilted on its axis. Day and night the sphere gets defined globe by its mapped on surface, darkened with age. The angle of the axis to the horizontal ornament stand defines an arc. It suggests an open mouth or a raised arm there is a pen holder too, though the pen is years ago lost. The cup of the holder even now angles up in welcome. Or is the holder meant to suggest a telescope? At one careful distance from every edge, the sphere keeps its heart at its center. Night and day there is no sun, no terminus any part of the surface moves toward. The sphere is still. Appetite. Earth's shadow fakes a smile with the moon. Headlights shadow a field of stalks away over snow. My own shadow shadows me. I am allowed sometimes by my house not far from its shelter. 
What I've had to eat teases my hunger to come again, for more is what I am made. I've been reopened along the same incision, and though metal plates and wires, metal screws, can only be said to ache, I say it is the metal in this leg that tells me the sky is so full of mountains and trenches as the ocean, metal that warns me of my own weight held past a certain angle from the center. But anyone made roasting these potatoes until they're about right might turn the calendar to the next scene, a new sky over a different shore with windowed structures in the foreground and white sails demonstrating distance, might lift the reminder squares to face the wall, raise that hole to the nail. Inhuman. I will fall asleep but wake with the same mind. There was a boot print, dirt patterned on a jacket I found at a bargain. I would like to become so eloquent. There is much diction beyond me, admissible details in the kitchen fixtures, features, geese in formation lower toward the river to follow, but then not to land. Is parallel what those reflections are? It's the quality of vision, flicker fusion threshold that enables the hawk to strike at that speed, how the frames need to advance only so fast for the illusion. How to use a gravity well as a slingshot. Color-coded flags in the yard where not to dig. Someone knocks, stands a while, gives up, goes away. Things I'm going to fix include a bite, adding elements of fire and water. In the night, the sound of something outside I wish would die faster. Observatory. Morning is an ancient thing in motion. Were they like us, the primal, self-aware stargazer? All day the blue, all day the veil blue or gray, all day certain scintillating beauty and inexhaustible darkness withheld from us. From us comes the want. Earth, turn me. The bumblebee, <clears throat> the bumblebee. One, just flying into a flower of the zucchini plant as I approach the garden. It is cooler this morning and the prickles of the leaves have dew. I try to give the bee space as I pass through the narrow between the plants. I can hear the buzz those wings make. The bee flies to another plant. Behind me, the door is closed. Several birds fly away. When I pick the only ripe cherry tomato, possibly the same bee flies from beneath a near leaf. I'm not hurt. I have uh, three more poems. Scar Tissue. Rain began above while we were unaware. Humid for days, we felt like we'd done a wrong. Our pores opened, mechanical, utilitarian. We went inside the library. Call numbers lashed spines to a system. Through the wall of a study room, laughter could be described as braying. Once at a blood draw, 
My vein resisted the needle. The needle slipped aside inside my arm, despite repeated attempts. I made for the phlebotomist a joke I hoped would diffuse her growing anxiety. I waited for her smile in the white. Outside the library, a black metal table on a small patio in the embrace of three brick walls sits empty. I could sit there too. Uh, this is called Nostalgia. Sitting there bare-assed on the formerly thrift-priced couch in the shared living room, a private space for another 40 or so minutes, your lipstick left its evidence on the glass rim made artifact by Nostalgia. Wonder. Like the moment you made that soft gesture with your cheek against that part of my cerebellum that lights up in the magnetic coffin. So tight a space in the motionless white where motion is never far from whatever the mind is. If only a poster could be before me in the clinical machine, I would have it be the map of who you were to me in my mind then in the now that fades like life. to live in interesting times. The fluorescent light seems to struggle against death. Not dead yet, the fixture pulses every few or several seconds, bequeathing humility to the shadows. The light is beacon-like above the shelves of biography, the book named Elon Musk, the book named Flannery O'Connor, not being people, the biographies seem unirritated, self-contained. I am so irritated I can barely contain myself. I have practiced so long to learn to read and now feel myself as a tension launched against that light. Someone is responsible. I am just a patron of this library. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Another wonderful reading. A great night of poetry for us. So I am going to beg a little bit of forgiveness because this is our first time trying to do a virtual reading. And so I wanted to see if we had any questions from our Zoom audience. We do not. Though we do have a couple of uh, fans of Marx who say woot woot, so way to go in the chat. So we do have a few minutes, and I know both of our poets were super excited to be able to answer some questions. Um, I wanted to maybe start with one, and then we'll see if uh, folks in the audience uh, have a question. I have a microphone that I'll bring around so our folks on Zoom and the recording can hear the question if you have one to ask. Um, but I wanted to start, and I prepped them for this, and maybe we'll go with you first, Julie, because you've had more time to think about it. Um, has the pandemic had any impact on you as a writer, as a poet? Has it changed your process? Has it altered the fact that you can't get out and maybe observe the way you would have pre-pandemic times? So if you wanted to maybe respond to that. I was going to say, just if you could speak into the mic yes. so they can hear you. Yeah. You did tell me that beforehand. I completely forgot about it. But I knew that it wouldn't be too hard. Um, yeah, uh, I've written a couple of poems that, you know, s certainly uh, come out of this experience. Um, in terms of the isolation, I was already kind of there. Um, but it was more so. Definitely more so. And I, you know, I noticed that I picked for the reading a lot of uh, 
poems were, at least towards the end, that, you know, where I was in other places. And so maybe that, it, just the fact that I chose those means, I want to get out of here. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but uh, my main um, uh, generator of work uh, remained constant. It just had to go Zoom. And that's my writing group. And we just, some of us couldn't take the Zoom uh, for various valid reasons. Uh, but other, enough of us did that we kept meeting every week. And um, if it, it does have a little more effect for me to um, meet live, only because I'm so frugal. And I'm the one that lives in Cedar Rapids. So we meet here. And so I think, well, i got to spend that gas. I better have a poem. And so I have some little shred I bring, you know. And so most of them have been generated right before we meet. And it worked somewhat in Zoom, too. It still worked. It was habit by then. But I just want to say that <laughs> there was a period where we stopped meeting. I don't know how long it was. It was in 2009. We've been meeting forever. Um, it was in 2009, and uh, I don't know, maybe it was just over the summer and sort of into October. And I came across this old email that I had sent out to the group on the 15th of October. And I said something like, I see in my crystal ball that we're all gathered around a table, and we have poems, and there's lamplight, and I'm hungry, I smell something. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? And they came. And we've met ever since. And I don't know what I'd do without him. And I think that's Kathy over there. Is that Kathy? And Jan's here. And uh, Dan's here. So, you know, they came to this, too. So they're really great. And so that's what I need. It's, it, I could still have that with, with the Zoom. So, Perfect. Maybe. Thank you. Um, Mark, I actually I realize I can just come to you guys since I have a microphone. So. Oh, nice. Sorry, I made you get a little that's exercise, okay. Julie. Oh, that's okay. I, uh, my experience was uh, with the pandemic, I, it really just put a, a huge damper on my writing. I um, wrote very little. Uh, I was in the process of finishing the edits on Gravity Well, so I, I was working on that and doing some some revision and rewriting for that. And... Um, and then worked on uh, a few other non-writing projects. But uh, it was really only uh, later, once things started to open up and I was able to, to be around more people, uh, that I was able to start writing again. It's still much slower than it was before. And maybe um, a touch more filled with gratitude and gloominess. <laughs> but, uh, but it feels good to be writing again, for certain. Well, I know those of us that enjoyed hearing your readings, for both of you, we're glad to hear that you're continuing to write. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience here? We do have a couple minutes. Sure, I'll bring this over to you. I'd like to ask a process and product question. When is a poem finished? Oh, hold on, Mark. Let me bring this back to you. I can't believe you had a quick answer to that. That's that's a tough one. It's a, it's it's one of those questions that everybody sort of struggles with, and if sometimes you write something, you feel like it's just done right away, and other times, you'll look at that again the very next day and and realize you're going to be working on it for a while or give up on it. Um, but literally. While I was getting ready for this reading, I was getting ready to read the poem that has the, the magnetic coffin in it, right? And I thought, I, it's pretty far into the poem before that's introduced, and I don't know if people are going to recognize that that's a, an MRI machine or, you know, if it's going to be sort of disorienting to, to hear it. You know, reading it on the page, you know, you can kind of go back and look at it and see it there, but, um, but just hearing it and then moving on, it occurred to me that uh, perhaps I should have titled that um, MRI or magnetic resonance or something that sort of sets that for the, the reader. 
And, um, you know, I still might. I, I feel like there are other poems that I haven't, that have been published that later, when I, you know, read them out loud, I'll do them a little bit differently just because, you know, it's never done. And at the same time, it's in print, so I can't hurt it. <laughs> Good answer. All right, Julie, do you have a response? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, um, if someone publishes it, but even then, sometimes you revise. Um, I have usually to ill effect, though. I don't think, I don't know if I've ever gotten a, a, a poem published in a journal and then become dissatisfied with it and kept revising it, and actually, it did get better. Um, I don't. I'm really not sure. Probably maybe. Maybe I don't. I don't know. It's all a big scramble. It just you know just keeps just keeps moving on. And sometimes this doesn't happen to me very often. But I think sometimes you can actually steal some shred out of some failure and start again. You know, I I think that requires a greater vision than I have. I think other I think other folks in our you know poetry group and probably other writers and maybe Mark do that a lot. But I think it's rare for me. I. I I think I'm too loyal to a, a slow progression. Uh, but, you know, I got to work with what I have. All right, we actually have a couple of questions. Well, yes, we have a question. We're going to do this because we're actually going to be virtual, so I, or hybrid. Uh, so this is from James Popes. He says, uh, Julie, your style is very personal. How would you say the year of COVID affected your writing? So obviously I kind of asked that, but I guess maybe from the personal standpoint, is that, does it have an, an impact on what the pandemic has meant for you personally in terms of what you're writing? Hmm. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can vary it much from what I said to you. Um, I, I, I'm stunned. I, I, I have no reply. How about you? Um, oh, it was aimed at me, wasn't well, it? it? But that's all right. Um, oh, sorry. That's sorry. all right. I'm a dud on that. <laughs> if you don't have anything else to add, we won't make you guys. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that it's changed that much about. Me, I mean, obviously, our personal experiences are, have been uh, all of us somewhat more limited than they were before. Um, so, in terms of like writing about current uh, experiences, um, you know, I'm not going to be writing poems about traveling too much or anything like that. Uh, and uh, clearly, that has a, an effect on the the interior as well. Um, so, the perspective is probably a bit focused in the same way. All right, so we got an extra answer out of that one. That was good. Thank you, Mark. All right, well, I think uh, with that, we will go ahead and, oh, well, we have more questions. People are really being aggressive. So maybe one last question for you folks. Uh, and this one is from Mark. Um, see, many of your poems end on a powerful image. For example, through the vibration of a strand of a spider is invited to the struggle. Uh, through the vibration of a strand, a spider is invited to the struggle. Are these ending images that you see in the world the guide and inspiration for the poem's creation, or is it the other way around and the image is placed because it matches the idea of the poem? So let me come back and. Yeah, so certainly I want the, the image. Or, or the ending in general of any poem, uh, but I, I want it to be something that, uh, you know, is consistent to the poem and, and add something to the poem. Uh, I don't intend them to be some like a summary of any kind, but uh, a lot of times my hope is with end, ending with an image, it's a certain kind of removal of my own presence and it, leaving an image to have an emotional resonance with the, the reader, uh, you know, their, their own sort of 
a, a place for their own sort of emotional experience of the poem to, to land um, without perhaps the, the authorial I being um, as strongly present as it might be earlier in the poem. Great, thank you. All right, now I think we'll let that bring us to a close since we are at the top of the hour. So I wanted to thank uh, the two of you for coming and reading for us today, uh, Mark Ray and Julie Hansen. Please help me to thank them for this lovely reading. And thanks to those of you who joined us here at the Iowa City Public Library, as well as those of you uh, on Zoom. I think I'm looking at the right camera. Uh, we really appreciate this. As I mentioned at the outset, this was our first attempt at a hybrid uh, event, and I would say it went pretty well. So thanks to everyone involved. Uh, while I had you as a captive audience, I just did want to let you know about some of the other in-person events that we will be having here at the festival. Uh, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, back in this room, uh, Habib Tengawar and uh, Pierre Joris will be uh, doing a joint reading uh, Habib is here as part of the International Writing Program, and Pierre uh, is a guest this week of the International Writing Program, and they have done some work together, and I think it's going to be a, a really spirited uh, reading, so I would encourage you to come out for that. And then we are back in this room on Saturday. We do have some other virtual-only events uh, throughout the course of, of the days in between, and I would invite you to look at iowacitybookfestival.org for that schedule. But on Saturday, we come back here to this room at 11.30, where we will have Gregory Galloway, uh, another Writer's Workshop uh, graduate who will be reading from his third book and his debut crime fiction uh, work, which is called Just Thebes. And then we have a, a bit of a, a track uh, around the topic of immigration, where we will have three authors speaking to that topic. Uh, Christy Navin Warren uh, will be speaking at 1 p.m. She's here at the University of Iowa and will be uh, reading from and talking about her new book, Meatpacking America. And then at 2.30, Chewy Renteria is going to be speaking uh, and reading from his uh, new memoir, uh, We Heard It When We Were Young, which is another University of Iowa Press book. And then at 4 o'clock, this is actually a virtual event. This is where we really test our virtual um, skills because Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz will be presenting via Zoom, but we will have uh, the ability for an in-person audience because we hope that folks that see Christy and Chewy will want to stick around and see this as well. Um, this is her book called Not a Nation of Immigrants. And so it's a really powerful look at uh, immigration and how it has... Uh, played a part in uh, the, the founding and the continuation of our country. So we hope you'll take the opportunity to come to some or all of those. And then on Sunday, back in this room at 1 o'clock, we have Deb Marcourt, who's the Poet Laureate for Iowa, and Shreya Kohler, who is a senior at uh, Iowa City West High School and is the inaugural poet, excuse me, youth poet ambassador for the state, uh, a, a wonderful, uh, talented young woman. And the two of them will be uh, reading from their poetry and, and talking about uh, their respective programs. And again, that's at one o'clock on Sunday back in this room. Everything we do at the festival will be streamed as well. Some things are only virtual, but everything that's in person, uh, as we saw tonight, will be streamed as well. So if you can't make it, uh, I would encourage you to join us that way. And everything will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel as well. I think you forgot one thing. Um, the International Panel. I did forget that. Thank you very much. So I forgot. A Friday afternoon panel. The International Writing Program yeah. is at noon back in this room. Thank you very much. I didn't have much to, inter uh, to do with the organization of that, so it slipped my mind. But yes, uh, the, the International Writing Program, of course, does their uh, Friday panels here in this room uh, where they have various writers who are participating in that program taking part. And the Friday panel this week is part of our festival and will be happening at noon. And I believe the topic is reality hunger. So uh, you should uh, come and check that out as well. So thank you very much. Um, yes. There are films that are being shown at Film Scene uh, as part of the festival schedule. Um, they are tied in with our program to read uh, the Brothers Karamazov. So we're about halfway through that, uh, led by Dr. Anna Barker at the University of Iowa. We're reading about a chapter a day of the Brothers Karamazov. And then there are a lot of related programs tied in with that, including a series of films that are at Film Scene. Uh, to be honest, I can't recall off the top of my head which one is today, but uh, that is a good reminder that we do have 
over here on the side as well as back on the table from Prairie Lights, a full schedule of everything that's happening at the festival so you can check that out and, and see what's going on. And that is a good reminder for me as well to let you know that at the back of our room, for those of us who are here live, is uh, our table from our friends at Prairie Lights who have both Mark and Julie's books to sell. And I'm sure that Mark and Julie would love to stick around and, and uh, meet you and, and have uh, the chance to sign your book as well. So thank you very much. I think we'll bring tonight's program to a close. And maybe help me once again to thank Julie and Mark for tonight. Thank you.